Dear students, welcome to this lecture. Today, our topic of discussion is Constitution Assembly Debates, Making of Indian Constitution. This lecture comprises of following objectives. To understand the meaning of Constitution Assembly Debates. To understand the context in which Constitution Assembly was formed. To study the debate on unitary and federal form of government in the Constituent Assembly. To study the debate on minority rights in the Constituent Assembly. To study the debate on fundamental rights in the Constituent Assembly. To study the debate on emergency powers in the Constituent Assembly. Constituent Assembly debates refer to the exercise of making constitution of an independent India that took place in the form of debates and discussions among the Constituent Assembly members. Constitution making represents in some sense a crystallization and codification of the aspirations that dominated the Indian freedom struggle against the British colonial rule. The constitution that resulted after the serious deliberation of about three years time reflect the codes that was meant to legitimate post-colonial dispensation that emerged in India from historical conflicts and struggles that brought them forth. Against the foreign colonial state, it established the power of indigenous Indian public. Aditya Nigam calls the Indian constitution as a text without author, as it was not written by one person, rather it is the result of debate and deliberations in the constituent assembly constituted of the members from varied ideological backgrounds. It's important to understand the serious debates that went on the constituent assembly. The debates provide an important window into the India's freedom struggle and the concerns that animated from the framers of the constitution. It's interesting to note that constituent assembly debates started with the absence of three important stakeholders, which are the members of the Muslim League, representatives of the princely state, and the star walled political leader Mahatma Gandhi. Even Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who acted as a chairperson of drafting committee of the constituent assembly, was actually not part of it and he was incorporated later when he was nominated as the Congress candidate from Bombay constituency. Finally, the members elected for constituent assembly carried out deliberations for almost three years from December 9, 1946 to January 24, 1950, which resulted into the final draft of the constitution of India. The constituent assembly comprised of 210 members elected from provinces and 64 members nominated by the princely states who participated in the debates. There were various committees formed within the Constituent Assembly to deal with various issues such as Fundamental Rights and Minorities Committee, Union Powers Committee and Drafting Committee. It was the Drafting Committee that scrutinized and revised the draft created by the constitutional advisor Sir B. N. Rao and submitted it for the consideration of the assembly. The members of the drafting committee had a higher share in the discussions since they frequently responded to what other members had to say on various issues. The members of this committee frequently responded to comments made by other members during the discussion. In the constituent assembly, there were only 15 women and out of them only 10 took part in the debates. Though each and every part of the articles related to various issues was discussed in the constituent assembly. For this lecture we will have a look on some of the important ones. First let's have a look on decentralized versus federal state debates. In the constituent assembly there was a dominant majority who desired for a centralized state. This appears both in relation to the question of residuary powers for the provinces 
as well as in relation to the composition of cabinets in the provinces as well as in the center. In the case of provinces, this is expressed in the attempts to keep the council of ministers under the direct control of the governor. Most of the members who expressed their support for the centralized state had a fear of demands such as secession, as was their experience during the demand of Pakistan by the members of Muslim League. It was reflected during moving of amendment by Mahbub Ali Beg Sahib Bahadur for proportional representation and loose federation, and it was criticized by nationalists like Algarai Shastri and Mahavir Tyagi. It was during the debate that Tyagi went on to remind the House that the country had to face partition because of mixed bag of cabinet and that Beg's insistence of proportional representation was in effect to revive the potent of partition. Another fear in the minds of nationalists who supported the centralized state was that of those princely states which were still out of purview of nation states jurisdiction. Similarly, there were many issues hanging for a newly independent nation state which was believed to be tackled through the centralized government only. It seems that the impulse towards centralization was not simply born out of drive towards an authoritarian state. Rather, members of Constituent Assembly wanted some form of democracy. Granville Austin, one of the serious scholars of Indian constitution, is of the opinion that draft constitutions published by the groups of left, center and right were also parliamentary centralized constitutions. In fact, Austin goes further to suggest that nearly everyone in the Constituent Assembly was Fabian or Lascalite, enough to believe that socialism is everyday politics for social regeneration and that democratic constitutions are inseparably associated with the drive towards economic equality. So, the desire by the majority of the members in the Constituent Assembly for the centralized state was not much as communal one to keep the Muslim League out of the power, as the glimpse of debate might suggest, that on contrary, it was desired for a modern and homogeneous nation state that moved them into taking such position. Thus, there was a strong need felt by many senior members of the Constituent Assembly that there is a need of a strong center to keep large and diverse country like India intact and unified. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was strongly supporting the proposal of keeping the center strong. Though there was division of powers to govern and make legislations between center and state by formulating state list and central list respectively. There was also proposal to have concurrent list where both the center and the state can make laws. But any kind of unitary tendencies which the constitution was turning into was criticized by other members. Loknath Mishra, member of United Province, expressed his opinion that this kind of an arrangement will render state governments powerless and it will be seen as a dictatorship of the center over the states. Similarly, Mahbub Ali Beg expressed his concerns about turning the federal character of constitution into unitary one, as there were too many provisions in the center and concurrent list in comparison to the state list. Let's have a look now on the question of minority rights. One more interesting debate during the proceedings of Constituent Assembly was that of the question of minority rights. It generated a lot of heat even before the Muslim members joined the proceedings. It started actually with the Christian members of the assembly. In the course of debate, K.M. Munshi, 
more that one part of the clause, clause 18, be referred back to the advisory committee. While as Mohanlal Saxena and Mahavir Tyagi wanted the entire clause to be referred back to it. Though there was no concrete reason given for such act, but Dr. B. R. Ambedkar made an observation and pointed out that the only reason one can sense is that rights of minorities will be decided after seeing what the Pakistan Assembly decided. He forcefully argued against such relativity of rights. According to him, minority rights should be absolute. It's important to highlight that members of minorities, particularly Muslims, were under tremendous pressure during this debate for minority rights. There was repeated hackling and booing accompanied by continued insuasion that there were still nursing their separatist desires allegedly for their elegance to the two nation theory. So what Indian constitution has in the form of minority rights has passed through a difficult stage during a period when it was conceived. No doubt there are strong elements of liberalism in the constitution and the debates in the reflection for such concerns. According to Aditya Nigam, what's not so evident in the way in which what was speakable and what not was shaped altogether in an altogether different arena. The insistence of some of the members who favored strong centralized state was on the value of individual citizenship and separate column for minority rights. They possibly believed so with their belief of particular kind of nation state where individual citizenship will be criteria regulating states dealing with its people. On the other hand, members of minority committee were concerned that they might face the problem of discrimination at the community level. So they believed that all its problems as a minority cannot be articulated in the language of individual rights. Moreover, they argued that they have lost the possibility of separate political representation. They will need separate safeguards. Now let's have a look on the question of linguistic rights. One of the debates that happened in the Constituent Assembly was about imparting of education in the mother tongue. A Muslim member from the United Province moved an amendment to the draft constitution proposing the inclusion of an additional clause saying that citizens of India residing in any part of the country and having a distinct language and script shall be entitled to education in their mother tongue. Larry invoked the Motilal Nehru committee report and argued that the students from Urdu speaking families should be imparted education in Urdu. In response, Pandit Govind Ballabai Pant stated that there is no particular language attached to the followers of any particular religion. Therefore, the question of language with reference or vis-a-vis -vis any minority does not arise at all. No language is the language of Hindus and no language is the language of Muslims. He went on to add that boys are taught in their mother tongue in primary schools and that the mother tongue of Hindus and Muslims and all boys is more or less the same. There is no difference whatsoever. The emphasis on the uniform language to impart education represented the desire of these members for a homogeneous national culture. Another issue related to the language that created a heated debate in the Constituent Assembly was pertinent to that of national language. Some of the members from the United Province, such as R. V. Dulerkar, pointed out that 
Hindustani being the language understood by most of the population be made as the national language. After the creation of Pakistan as a separate state and adoption of Urdu as its national language, there was also proposal made by some of the members of Konishur Assembly that instead of Hindustani, Hindi shall be adopted as a national language of India and that too in Divangri script. But there was displeasure expressed by some of the members from the southern states of India such as T.T. Krishnamachari who warned the assembly that adoption of Hindi as a national language and neglecting other South Indian languages will create fissures in the polity and union of India. To settle the issue related to national language, a special committee was formed under the supervision of K. M. Munshi and Gopalasami Ayangar to come up with the formula which will satisfy all the camps. On the suggestions of Munshi Ayangar committee, it was finally decided that the working language for the official purposes will be Hindi under Indian constitution, but English will continue to be used for a period of 15 years for official purposes and interpretation of law and bills till Hindi as a language reached to that stage. One more important issue that was discussed in Constituent Assembly was about fundamental rights. As the decolonization of subcontinent was approaching, the urge for most of the members in the Constituent Assembly was to formulate the provisions of freedom and rights for free country, which India was going to be. There was a lot of time spent on deliberations to discuss the question of fundamental rights of the citizens of the free India. The Constitution of United States was considered as a model constitution to formulate the fundamental rights for the protection of citizens of independent India. At the outset, the members agreed that every citizen of India will be free to movement, to settle, to reside in any part of India, to acquire the property and to take up jobs, business and profession of his or her choice. For this proposal, a small amendment was proposed by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who was of the opinion that this freedom should be subject to such restraint as law may impose. According to K. M. Munshi, instead of all citizens, all persons should be equal before law, which was also accepted by majority of the core appointed within the Constituent Assembly to formulate the fundamental rights of the citizens. In order to attain the equality of all citizens, Professor K. T. Shah also raised the point that the hereditary titles which give privilege to certain classes should not continue in free India. Raj Kumari Amrit Kaur along with other members supported this proposal and readily accepted to leave her hereditary title. But at the same time, it was agreed upon that if a foreign country confers a title or honor to a citizen of India, there should be no problem in that, provided permission of union legislature will be required. There was also discussion on the question of absolute freedom. Though many members were in support of absolute freedom, but Aladi Krishnasamy Iyer expressed his reservation by saying that absolute freedom is utopian dream. For the sake of law and order, there need to be certain form of restraints. It was at this point that Dr. B. R. Ambedkar urged the need for the provision of the habeas corpus where the person will be informed about the reason of his or her deprivation of liberty within 24 hours of his or her arrest. There was a heated debate among the members on the inclusion of freedom of expression as a fundamental right. Though 
the members welcomed this but there was also apprehension that expression of person should not hurt the sentiments of any community or cause any violence or crime. On the issue of freedom of expression, the mother Sarup Seth stressed on the need of separate clause for the press freedom in the country. During these deliberations, not only what citizens should be provided as fundamental rights was discussed, but also what need to be curtailed and banned became the part of the discussion. For example, K. M. Munshi and K. T. Shah proposed the ban on the bonded agricultural and industrial labor, whereas Rajkumari Amrit Kaur proposed the similar ban on the child labor. Apart from other fundamental rights, this core committee also agreed that there should be universal adult suffrage, free and fair periodical elections and the formation of independent institution of election commission under the union law. Though strongly supporting the individual rights of citizens, Dr. Ambedkar also proposed the provision of dropping all the rights in case of emergency when there is a danger against the Union of India. On the insistence of just B. N. Rao, the Constituent Assembly also included some of the rights in the form of direct to principles of state policy, which the state will fulfill in the near future. Lastly, let's have a look on the question of emergency powers. There was worry among some of the members of Constituent Assembly that the provisions of emergency powers will lead to the encroachment on the state sphere, which would partially paralyze the administration. Naziruddin Ahmed, a Muslim member from West Bengal, was of the opinion that by provisions of emergency powers to the president and the governor, the central government will become unpopular in the provinces. According to him, the states will gradually get dissatisfied and they will show centrifugal tendencies and this will be reflected in the general elections to the house of the people at the center. It was during this debate only that the unbiased nature of the office of governor and powers of the office of governor to dissolve the legislative assembly of the state were discussed. In response to worries expressed by Naziruddin Ahmed, the other senior member of Constituent Assembly supported the intervention of the center through the provision of emergency and said, Mr. Nizamuddin Ahmed said that in that case, the center takes up the whole administration in its own hands and so there will be confusion. But I say that it is just to avoid such confusion and chaos that the center takes on the administration. Are we to continue that confusion and chaos which have resulted from the failure of constitutional machinery? Similarly, Algurai Shastri from United Province, while in support of Article 188, which gives powers to the governor of the states to declare the existence of emergency and take the administration of the state in his own hands. But at the same time, he was of the opinion to make the distinction between the emergency powers vested in the President of Indian Union and that of governors of the states. According to him, if the country is going through a situation when it is threatened by a disaster, the President of Indian Union has to exercise his own discretion and declare an emergency. The governors, on the other hand, according to him, may be faced the similar situation concerning only their state and they can issue proclamation of emergency at the state level. Dear students, so in this lecture, we discussed in brief as 
what we mean by the constituent assembly debates, the context in which constituent assembly was formed, the time period of the constituent assembly and the various committees that were formed. Among the various issues, we looked in detail the deliberations on the question of unitary versus federal form of the government and the reasons which were presented by various members in support of either form. We also discussed how there were varied opinions on the question of minority rights and linguistic rights. The most important part of the constitution is considered as the part third, which comprises of the fundamental rights. And we discussed how the debate over incision of various rights took place. At last, we also discussed the provisions of emergency powers allocated to president and the governor and the worries expressed by various members related to this. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thank you.